The purpose of this vehicle really is to be the emergency, the ambulance of food trucks, right? It comes in the form of a very large uh, Class B vehicle truck. She is a rapid response field kitchen, and the purpose of that is to set up very quickly after a disaster or an incident. In this case, it was the landfall in the big bend of Florida of Hurricane Debbie. But the entire truck built to suit our needs, so it is a self-contained unit. So it's got all of the canned ingredients that we don't need on there, all the proteins that we need on there with refrigeration units. It's got solar panels to keep itself charged. Um, it's got its own internet system so that we can coordinate with teams, we've got radio equipment, so that when we have what we call our scouting vehicles, our teams moving out into those isolated areas and reporting back to understand what that need might look like, where are people cut off. We specialize in end of mile or last mile delivery. Truck has the capabilities to do hundreds in a single spot, set up, cook those hundreds, and then pick up and move to another location. Neighbors helping neighbors, regardless of who you were, what color you were, where you came from, or what you needed. People live on a fixed income and you're looking at your refrigerator or your freezer and everything is spoiled and you have to throw it away. It's pretty devastating. A real home cooked meal people really appreciate. Thank you, Sue. You're very welcome. Have yeah. a great one. You too and good luck to you and your mom. It's actually just it's more than just salt and crackers. It's um it's really replenishing. It's, water's not going to do it all, especially for someone like my mom who's diabetic and takes insulin. She needs something that's a little bit more substantial. Dollar General was kind enough to support us in this vehicle, and it's, it's really important to have partners like that to really be more connected to the community, to be able to reach more people, and I don't think we could do it without companies like Dollar General and people that donate to us to get, get the mission done faster. A Russian court has sentenced a dual Russian-American citizen to 12 years in prison for treason. Ksenia Karolina was found guilty on Thursday of donating $51.80 to a charity supporting Ukraine. The Los Angeles resident pleaded guilty at a closed trial in the Ural city of Yekaterinburg. Karolina's case was heard by the same court and judge that convicted Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich of espionage in July. The court said investigators found Karolina had, on the 24th of February 2022, the first day of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, transferred funds in the interests of a Ukrainian organization, which was then used for ammunition, medicines and weapons. Supporters say the donation had gone to a New York-based charity called Razom for Ukraine that provides humanitarian aid to children and the elderly in the country. The charity has denied it provides any military support to Kiev. Karolina's lawyer, Mikhail Mushailov, said they would appeal the verdict. Ksenia's emotional state is undoubtedly depressed. How else could it be, considering that the court sentenced her to 12 years imprisonment? However, she was prepared for this sentence, for this term. We had discussed this beforehand. Although the 33-year-old was not included in a recent major prisoner swap that freed Gerskovich, among others, her lawyer said he had hoped she would be included in a future exchange. Although Carolina has not been designated by Washington as wrongfully detained, a label that would open up diplomatic avenues to negotiate a prisoner exchange. Carolina was born in Russia and emigrated to the United States in 2012, receiving American citizenship in 2021. She was arrested by the FSB security services after flying to Russia to visit her family in Yekaterinburg at the start of the year. Carolina was initially arrested on hooliganism charges and jailed for 15 days. Just before her release, she was slapped with a state treason charge. Acquittals for serious crimes are nearly unheard of in Russia. In the British Museum, we have objects of all sizes, and once in a while, one of the very smallest things turns out to have information in it which is totally unexpected. My name is Irving Finkel and I'm a curator in the British Museum and welcome to my course. So what we have here is a clay tablet. As a matter of fact, it is not a real clay tablet, it is a replica because the real clay tablet has to be on exhibition all the time. The ancient Mesopotamians, Sumerians, Babylonians, all those people, they wrote on clay. That was their natural activity 
and clay tablets, which have impressions of writing on, are pretty good, they're pretty stable, you can handle them, you can't play football with them, but they're pretty reliable. But what happens in antiquity is there are wars and buildings collapse and fires and disasters and people die and they go away and other people come and trample on things. And when archaeologists find them, it is not often that an ancient inscription on a piece of clay comes to light in perfect condition. But nevertheless, this piece of cuneiform inscription is a remarkable thing. This is the oldest map of the world in the world. It has two sides. This is the front or obverse, and this is the back or the reverse. And the reverse consists of lots of lines of cuneiform in different ruled sections. So it's full of information, even though it's a bit damaged. But the other side is the remark, and it's this which is so exciting. Because if you look carefully, you will see that the flat surface of the clay has a double circle drawn in the surface of the clay. Now, the double ring is very important because it has cuneiform writing in it, which says it's the bitter river. And this water was deemed to surround the known world, because the area inside the double ring is ancient Mesopotamia itself. Now, this word Mesopotamia is the ancient Greek word for what is modern Iraq. So inside the drawing of this circle, we have very interesting things. There is a great river that runs from north to south, which is the Euphrates River. And the river is straddled by a long oblong, which is obviously the city of Babylon. So this is a very important ring of water, because it meant for the Babylonians they had a sort of idea of the limits of their world, where they live, in about the 6th century BC, with these important rivers which brought life and food to them, waterways for transport, all the way down to the Persian Gulf. It was kind of depicted in small. And if you look carefully at the picture, you will see that in the surface of the known world, there are these rings drawn with little bits of cuneiform inside those. And those tell you the name of the city which it represents, or sometimes the tribe. So you have encapsulated in this circular diagram the whole of the known world in which people lived, flourished and died. However, there's more to this map than that, because if you look at the outer ring, you will see that going off at different angles are triangles. Sometimes people say they are islands, sometimes people say they are districts, but in point of fact they are almost certainly mountains, because the idea is that if you go across the water, you see these jutted, pointed things above the horizon, which are remote lands far beyond the limits of the known world, which go out in different directions from the perimeter of existence. And they are, for the Babylonians, places full of magic and full of mystery. So although this is a map which would not encourage you, perhaps, to motor across Iraq today in a Land Rover, when it comes to operating beyond the limits of the known world, into the world of imagination. It's indispensable. Its failings, as it were, from a cartographical point of view, are irrelevant. It is not what they're interested in, and it's given us a tremendous insight into many aspects of Mesopotamian thinking. This is the tip of Ukraine's spear. Ukrainian special forces pushing deeper into Russia. Kiev says it now controls nearly 1,000 square kilometers, taking prisoners and destroying critical infrastructure. Over the weekend, Ukraine blew up the third and last key bridge in Russia's Kursk region, encircling and cutting off a strip of Russian territory about the size of Ottawa from escape or reinforcements. The Ukrainians are digging in. They have field hospitals. They have all the surrounding apparatus that would indicate they're, they're there for the long haul. Ukraine's president said the incursion, now entering its second week, aims to create a buffer zone to prevent Russia from launching cross-border attacks. Volodymyr Zelensky also suggested the territory could provide leverage in future ceasefire talks. But the Russian president doesn't appear interested in negotiating. His country under attack, Vladimir Putin visited neighboring Azerbaijan to discuss energy cooperation. 
Just last June, Putin had warned that any attack on Russian territory risked nuclear war. What the Ukrainians have brilliantly done with this incursion is shown the world that these Russian red lines were really just a bluff. Uh, the Russian reaction thus far has been quite subdued. The incursion has forced Moscow to divert some troops home from Ukraine, but Russia's offensive continues, now advancing on the east Ukrainian region of Pokrovsk. And it seems like the Russians don't really care about their own territory as much as conquering Ukrainian territory. The Ukrainian advance is now slowing, and it's unclear whether Kyiv can hold its newly captured territory. But analysts say this incursion is about more than land. This has changed the narrative to a degree. The Ukrainians have made it very clear that Vladimir Putin is also vulnerable. After two and a half years, as Western allies were growing weary, Ukraine's offensive has given its supporters and its people new reason to hope. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Rescue, in very simple terms, is about taking something that is unsellable and diverting it away from wastage, from being thrown away, and giving it another life. And it might be that you are able to share this with someone who can consume it, uh, or you're giving it to somebody who, who really needs it, the needy, for example, a low-income family. Half of the time that I'm awake is probably spent uh, either organizing or going for or thinking about or planning uh, a food rescue. Closer to the closing time of the shop, I will be advised if there is a collection. Then when we reach the site, we will show them our D2L badge to say that we are a representative of D2L and that we are food rescuers. I started off with uh, having to put a little bit more food on my table for my family of six. Um, it really does help, uh, even for me, uh, in terms of financial, uh, it does stretch the dollar. I kind of like tell my kids and also bring them along and show them that there's this cycle of food sustainability as well. Yeah, so they see, kind of like see it from the top to the bottom. I do the carrying, the delivering, and then she does the packing and everything, and I just go. When you go and collect, you don't actually waste all the effort of the chef that he put in to bake all the bread. Yes, it, it is very tedious at times and sometimes when you come back from a food rescue, you feel really exhausted and you ask yourself, gosh, what did I get myself into? But 
you know, at the end of the day, when you look back, you're very happy that you did this because um, you know that this is for the benefit of the future generation. Two undercover reporters posing as donors are about to meet one of the key architects of Project 2025, the radical plan for Trump's second term, in a hotel suite rigged with hidden cameras. Meet Russ Vogt. Russell Vogt, the former director of the Office of Management and Budget. He's been called the most dangerous MAGA diehard you've never heard of. I am opposed to the Department of Education because I think it's the Department of Critical Race Theory. The Russ Vogt were comrades in arms. Formerly a cabinet member and chief lieutenant in the first Trump ad men. I want to thank Russ for doing an incredible job. He now runs a group called Center for Renewing America. An organization that I helped turn into the Death Star that is accomplishing yeah. all the debates that you are reading about. I think you have to rehabilitate Christian nationalism, you have the largest deportation in history, block funding for Planned Parenthood. I, I want to be the person that crushes the deep state. Vote is one of the key authors of the blueprint for a second Trump administration. Project 2025. It's an ambitious 920-page blueprint. Like eliminating the Department of Education. The mass firings of civil servants. Banning access to the abortion pill and further restricting abortion rights. In recent weeks, the plans have become so controversial that Trump has been forced to distance himself. They're sort of the opposite of the radical left, okay? You have the radical left and you have the radical right, and they come up with this, I don't know what the hell it is, it's Project 25. But behind closed doors, Vote tells us not to take Trump's disavowal seriously. I, I expect you to hear 10 more times from the rally, the president, you know, distancing himself from the left's boogeyman of Project 2025. Yeah. Uh, and you're not worried about that? I'm not worried about it. Okay. Our investigation into Project 2025 began two weeks before the meeting with Vogt at a conference for religious nationalists in D.C. The truth is, Christian nationalism is not a threat to American democracy. Christian nationalism founded American democracy. Journalists from the Center for Climate Reporting have come posing as potential donors. We make the acquaintance of Mika Meadowcroft, an author on Project 2025 and a close aide to Vogt. He tells us that Vote is running the secretive second phase of Project 2025. And the second phase after the book came out yeah. was to break down like actual sort of policy packets and like, executive orders and uh, agenda items and things like that. That's been supervised largely. The first phase of Project 2025 was a 922 page policy book published openly. The second phase is a comprehensive, concrete transition plan for each federal agency. These much more detailed plans are confidential. Yeah. Because obviously you want as little of it to be FOIA-able, yeah. if you're familiar with the FOIA process, as possible. Freedom of, Freedom Information, of Information Act, Act yeah. The Freedom of Information Act allows the public to request government communications, but Meadowcroft reveals they plan to avoid these rules. Yeah, the goal is you know, just familiarize all the transition team people with these plans, yeah. but you don't actually like send them to their work emails because then, right. you, know, you know, you could just give the handbooks to everyone. Be like, yeah. this is the game plan for the admin. Yeah. But if, if the press knows that that's what you're doing, that they're going to immediately just say like, I request all of your emails from Heritage. Okay. You know, you right. are a worker. Um, yeah, I see. So we'll see. Uh, Interesting. So, with loyalists installed in key government agencies and armed with his playbook, Vote believes a radical Christian nationalist agenda can be realized under a second Trump presidency. The Trump campaign recently picked him to write the Republicans' policy platform, making him essentially Project 2025's man on the inside. I think the best example is like the campaign selected me to be the platform uh, because of their, their views on my policy ideas and they're not running from all of the negativity that I get from the press. I see. So they haven't been spooked on you as a person, you don't think? No, I mean, I, I, no. I, I don't think I'm going to be their transition pick because yeah. then they have all these kinds of stories. Yeah. But no, the relationship is great. The head of the Trump transition team has not yet been appointed. But Vote says that no matter who is named, he'll be able to hand over his Project 2025 battle plans directly. If it's someone like Stephen Miller or Bob Lighthizer, then all the stuff gets uh, plugged right in. If it's not, we'll figure it out. 
Okay. But but all of it will be designed for a theory of the case that president, if 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 a battle plan is out there that will do what he wants, there are the people like me that have this trust that will will be able to get it to him. Uh, okay. in whatever position we're at, or I could be at Center for New America, but the relationships will be there, uh, the trust level will be there. Formula One pit stops have become as quick as 1.82 seconds. That's faster than most people can sign their name. The choreographed teamwork is incredible to watch, but it doesn't happen by chance. Teams spend hundreds of hours training, and every action is planned to the last millisecond. Here's how F1 crews achieve near superhuman speeds during a pit stop. Welcome to Explained. Formula One pit stops can literally win or lose a race. Box now, box, box now, box for hard. Stay out, stay out, stay out. Why, what if that's what do? And pit for? It's gone from 67 seconds back in the 1950s. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. To two seconds or less today. Crews consist of over 20 people and advances in technology has made a huge difference. But unless every element comes together in synchronized harmony, these pit stops can get ugly. A little bit of a problem. Is that fuel splashing? Terrific. Whoever made the call, the tyres weren't ready. So how are Formula One teams hitting the mark time and time again? One word, practice. Formula One teams get in 1,000 to 1,200 practice pit stops each before a season starts. And they practice through weekends before the race. But what kind of training do they do? First of all, members of the pit crew are either mechanics or engineers in the wider garage, so technical knowledge is a must. Pit crew are picked from the most capable people and assigned specific roles. Once the lineup is fixed, it doesn't change. And in case someone is ill, there's always a reserve train to step in for every position. Secondly, physical fitness is also of utmost importance. It's not just the F1 drivers who need to be at peak fitness. F1 car tyres typically weigh 11 and a half kilos each. Combine that with their size, which is 18 inches, and suddenly manoeuvring them in and out isn't so easy. Wheel guns are also underestimated. They rotate at 10,000 RPM and run at a 26 bar pressure. That's like a quarter of the pressure required to blitz a patio with a power washer. And given how fast it's used, it puts intense pressure on the operator's wrists and arms. Pit crew typically train and run drills five to six days a week, and this is penciled into their schedule in addition to their garage jobs. Teams travel with doctors and physiotherapists who monitor their fitness levels at all times. Physical tests assess each person's health pre-season, and training programs are put into place. Coaches then focus on building the team's overall core stability and strength. But plans are also individualised depending on the role that person plays in the team. For example, the jackman needs more shoulder and back strength to lift the car up. The gunmen need stronger arms and precision, while tyre fitters and removers need stronger backs, cores and legs. Then, the crew are taught visualisation techniques, breathing exercises and methods to stay calm under pressure during a pit stop. On top of it all, personalised food plans ensure they're getting the exact nutrition they need to build muscle. Next is the intense pit stop practice itself. Regular routines are practised to perfect coordination. Every detail is thoroughly planned, from what each person does, to where they stand, to how far they even stand from each other. Because the smallest deviation can have dramatic consequences. But he overshot his pit box. For Mercedes, so they brought Hamilton in, and a lap later, in comes Valtteri Bottas, and it's oh, the hard time. Right, the front's not even off yet. They Look. can't get the right front off. 
Basically, the idea is to have the perfect combination of people working together. Overall, the key is balancing speed with consistency. So drills are repeated till each of these actions becomes second nature, just like riding a bike. And all of this ultimately results in epic moments like this. So far, Team Williams and Team Red Bull have smashed the pit stop's two-second barrier a number of times. And fun fact, Team Red Bull got so good at it, they even did a pit stop in zero gravity just to prove a point. But with Formula One teams upping their training every season and with technology getting better, it might not be very long before we see that two-second barrier being cracked once again. It's no secret, Venice has a flooding problem. Here's St. Mark's Square. It's the lowest point in Venice. It used to be flooded only 40 times a year. Now it floods 250 times a year. But Venice also gets larger floods that can cover this much of the city. In the past, this was a very exceptional case. But since 2000, it's happened 16 times. In 2019, a catastrophic flood cost the city over $1 billion. So we brought in engineer Giovanni Ciccone to discuss how Venice can rain in the tides before it drowns. These are the Mose barriers, which Giovanni helped design and operate. They are mobile storm surge gates that rise to separate the Venetian lagoon from the sea. It's the city's six billion dollar solution to flooding. This is the Venice Lagoon with the three entrances, Lido, Malamocco, and Chioggia. Two times a day, the high tide comes in and fills the lagoon with water. The low tide then flushes the water back out to sea. To block high tides, the Mose barriers were installed in each inlet. This is the bottom of the canal in which the barriers are installed. And inside there is the flap gate. Each gate is 66 feet wide, 12 to 16 feet thick, and 61 to 97 feet tall, making the tallest gate more than half the size of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So if forecasts show especially high tides, the city raises the gates, which takes about 30 minutes. The air is pumped inside, it starts floating, but because of the hinges, it will assume a 50 degree position, keeping the sea higher and the lagoon at a lower level. Once raised, the barriers can maintain a difference in water level from the sea to the lagoon of about 10 feet. And for now, it's working. In 2022, a five and a half foot tide was forecasted to hit Venice, which could have flooded 82% of pedestrian walkways. Because of the barriers, locals and tourists only had to face wind and rain. But when the 78 Mose barrier gates are raised, they don't just keep water out. They also keep what's in the lagoon in. That's an issue because some of Venice's sewage flows into the lagoon and requires the tide to wash it out. But there's another engineering solution, a much larger one, a super levee. The super levee will enclose the city inside this red line. Ordinary levees are embankments meant to block floodwaters, but significant flooding can flow over the top or seep through, breaking the levee and cascading into the area it's meant to protect. Super levees solve this problem by creating a flood protection zone. They have a wide footprint with a low-grade backslope. In Venice, it would be about 13 feet tall and extend almost 400 feet along the base. It makes them resistant to water overflow and seepage. And even if water reached the top, it would flow slowly down the slope, instead of cascading down like it would with a standard levee. In Venice, a super levee would divide the lagoon, forming a lake inside the boundary. There will be a permanent opening to allow the flushing of the city so the water will enter continuously and we can produce electricity here. Pumps would help mimic the natural tide. This will allow the, the water to circulate inside the city to keep the city fresh so we can swim again in the city. And on top, there would be room to build infrastructure. Garage, transportation, a bicycle route, a trees, and lastly, we can relocate the tourism from the historical city to the super levee.
But this plan faces a hurdle. Construction of the Mose system was embroiled with corruption and delays. Building a super levy by the time the Mose barrier becomes ineffective would require laws to change and the public's approval. What we can learn from the past is we need direct participation of the people. In the meantime, Venice has found other ways to adapt to the rising tides. Glass barriers protect ancient monuments from the salt water, raised walkways funnel crowds around, and Venetians wear waders. The history of Venice is a 2,000 year history of adaptation in which the solution were found by trial and error. I am optimistic because uh, there will be great transformation in the future. Now, a new analysis shows that the six-ton iconic altar stone at the heart of Stonehenge originated from northeastern Scotland rather than southwest Wales. The discovery shows that its construction was a far greater collaborative effort than scientists believe. Here's our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh. It's one of the most famous prehistoric monuments in the world and also one of the most mysterious. Why was Stonehenge built in southwest England 5,000 years ago? And what was it used for? What we do know is that the giant outer stones are probably sourced locally from England. The inner blue stones are from Wales. And we now know that the central altar stone is from northeastern Scotland and not from Wales as once thought. The irony is that the discovery was made by a young Welshman he still remembers being brought to the site as a one-year-old in 1992. I remember coming with my dad and being on his shoulders and looking over at the stones. So it's nice to kind of come full circle and make this discovery at somewhere so special to me. You're a, a proud Welshman and you've taken the Welsh status away from the stone. So how do you think it'll go down in Wales? Yeah, I'm not sure they'll ever talk to me again. It's a loss for Wales, no doubt. But Wales has contributed so many rocks to this monument, I'm sure Scotland can have one. Anthony analysed the rock and discovered it had a unique date and composition. In the journal Nature, he says it could only have come from the far north of Scotland, here in the Orcadian Basin, which includes Caithness, Orkney and Moray Firth. So this is the altar stone, the heart of Stonehenge, now partially buried. It's one of the largest stones here, at around six tonnes, the big question is how on earth it was transported from North East Scotland and why the people back then thought it was so important to bring it all this way. They must have been very technically advanced to be able to do that, to bring it down by boat, bring it down on, uh, on sledges or whatever. Overland. And presumably it wasn't just a matter of engineering. It, there must have been some sort of social cohesion for you know, the Scots and the Welsh yep. and the English to all to work together. Absolutely, to, to, to bring this to here, a, a, a sort of focus in a way at, at that time, um, there must have been uh, linking between all of these areas. So what does this say about Neolithic society in Britain? Well, it certainly implies great social connections and sophistication. And I think what we've got to remember is these people were just like us in a way. You know, they were just as clever, but they had different technologies. But to bring a stone of this size uh, all the distance from what we now call Scotland is really quite something. The new discovery has changed the story of Stonehenge and those that built it. The tale is now of a people across Great Britain who were more interconnected and advanced than previously thought, who came together to build this incredible monument. Palab Ghosh, BBC News, Stonehenge. What kind of dance is this? This is the dance of later. Uh, which we call Finicling. So it originated here? Yeah, it originated here. Well, it looks difficult. Can it is. someone who's never done it maybe try a little bit of it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Tinikling was invented during the Spanish colonial era. The word tinikling is a reference to a local bird called a tikling. Rice farmers love to trap them, but the bird is so nimble that it can dodge the bamboo traps. Tickling dancers are meant to be as agile as a tickling. Hopefully I don't disappoint. We, 
we'll have our bamboo clicking first. It looks like this. In, out, in, in, out, in, in, out. Okay. Now, let's try it. Okay. <laughs> you hold your arm. Oh, yeah. okay. In, in, out. In, in, out. Now, now we go to the rhythm. <laughs> Ready? From the basic step, we can move into something which uh, will complicate, but still using the same rhythm, same uh, dance step. Ready? Let's try it. Go. Right, right, back. From here, you are going to start turning on your first. One and two. So you One, right, right. And two, turn, turn, then you go up there. And then you repeat the whole thing. Let's see how much I learned in the last two minutes. <laughs> okay, go. And come back, turn. Repeat. Come back, come back and turn. turn. And, uh, I can't okay. do this. Finally, it's time to go full speed. <laughs>